Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and knife collecting and hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go round. I'm Bob DeMarco, and coming up, we're going to take a look at some Brian Brown knives close up. Uh, we will take a look at Buck's March 2022 Knife of the Month. I love that they have that and such a thing exists. And then Old Gold, we're going to take a look at 10 long-serving knives in my collection, all the way from my very first one uh, to one that I believe I was stalked perhaps by a mountain lion while carrying. I'll get into that later. Uh, but first, let's uh, have a pocket check, uh, shall we? First opportunity of the week to show off my knives and what I've been carrying today. Kind of a subdued and classic carry. Um, well, let's get to it. First, my uh, front right pocket, I had the Spyderco Patata, which, by the way, is an excellent lefty uh middle finger flicker knife. This is a nearly four inch blade, a uh, very unique blade style with a, a quite uh, acute point. That's what I'm trying to say, acute point. I don't carry this one too often because it scares me. I'm always worried I'm gonna uh, mess up the tip. It is very, very fine. Uh, they do make a smaller version of this uh, and I'm, I'm not sure they remedy that issue, uh, if you would call it that, in the smaller version, the Patadese, I believe it's called. But the whole deal with this knife, it's part of their ethnic series, and the ethnicity is, well, Italian, Sardinian. This is from uh, this knife, this blade shape and handle shape is uh, comes from Sardinia, an island off of Italy, and it's sort of a do-all knife. Everyone has these uh, for food, you know, picnicking, for work, for defense, for what have you. And it has that very signature uh, sort of two-plane cutting-edge blade and uh, handle with that sort of uh, uh, hook on the end. Very often you'll see them made out of horn. This is contoured G10. If you look at it in cross section, it's nicely rounded. Uh, this is made in Maniago, Italy. Um, not sure who the manufacturer is. I'm not sure, Lion Steel perhaps. I know that they've partnered, uh, Spyderco has partnered up with Lion Steel in the past. It's just a super, high quality knife but also uh you know i like it because it represents part of uh, what my cultural heritage is and i think it's a really uh nicely sized knife too i like the larger sp uh, spider coes but the fact that that blade tapers off to such a fine point makes it feel like it's not that big you know it makes it feel like a manageable knife but that is a nearly uh, four inch blade and it is quite manageable thin slicey n690 co uh, steel. I know a lot of people kind of poo-poo that. Uh, most of these Italian companies use that blade steel just as a matter of course. And, um, you know, you can do a lot better, especially with some of the European steels. Uh, but this is uh, not so much about that as it is about the design. Uh, I would use this lightly for EDC because of that tip. Uh, but uh, a wonderful knife, nonetheless. Uh, next up, I have the also very thinly ground and charming Finch Model 1929. Um, and this, uh, I haven't carried this one in a little while. It's a little chunker. It uh, comes in at a full half inch uh, wide. It's got these steel bolsters and liners and um, really nice bone here, bone handle. It's called Nightcrawler Bone. You can see it kind of looks, uh, if you're looking at this, uh, you can tell why they call it that because it's got a variation in the red, in this sort of ribbed red. First of all, the, the ribbed jigging or whatever you want to call that, the ribbing carved into it is evocative of the texture of a Nightcrawler. And then the color and the, and the depth of it, it's sort of blood red. Uh, beautiful, beautiful... Um, uh, bone cover material here. Finch does a great job of giving you a modern flipper knife with uh, old school styling. Uh, the most recent one, the Roadrunner, I'm I'm just about to order. It's it's one of the tabs on my computer currently. I want to get it directly from them. Um, I I rarely buy directly from the company, and in this case, I definitely want to. Uh, and 
Burlwood. That's where I'm getting. Burlwood, they have these old school resins. They have bone, uh, just a lot of cool material. And, and then, of course, micarta. They use a lot of micarta handles. Uh, this is an excellent little utility knife. Uh, this one has come out a couple of times today, um, mostly just to charm the crowd. Uh, lastly was my fixed blade. This is a rare carry for me. Uh, this one is the uh, Cold Steel Culloden. It's an old fixed blade. This, I remember I had on me in my bag uh, on 9-11, on, on September 11th, uh, 2001. And I was in New York City. I had this in my bag. And I remember feeling like at the time, I'm glad I had it on me. I don't know why, not that uh, you know this knife could have done anything, but it made me feel secure. And in any case, I rarely carry it, but it's really well set up for in the waistband carry which uh, incidentally i think uh lynn thompson is a big proponent of so you have on the sheath on this um uh, on this side of the sheath the non-clip side of the sheath you have a lot more cover coverage it's asymmetrical and goes almost all the way up the handle so that as you draw this and you have the sheath pressing against your flesh if you have love handles and let's just we'll just say it, uh, Lynn Thompson has love handles. He designed this so that you don't cut your love handles as you extract this knife from in the waistband carry. And I love it because depending on the season, depending on the year, I have love handles too. And um, they, you know, sometimes they're more extreme than others, uh, but I never want them cut. You know, I want to, I want to cut them out of my life, but I don't want to slice them off my body with my carry. So uh, I, I do appreciate this sheath design and and the way this knife uh sits when it's in the sheath if you if if you can see this uh you'll note and if not just uh, listen up here uh the very short truncated handle this is based on the ski and do uh, the sock knife of the of the um, scottish clansmen you know you see guys in kilts and they have this the little knife uh, in their sock that's what this is based on and that's what that handle is. It's short, very thin and flat. So it's not going to turn in your hand. And it's got that that rubbery craton material. But if you if you can uh, if you can imagine right here at the end at the pommel, it tilts in. And that's so that when it's in the waistband, it doesn't print. You don't have a handle sticking straight up to print on your shirt. It sort of contours to your body there. And I appreciate that little detail too. You don't see stuff like that much. Uh, it's got really interesting jimping here that works very well. It's sort of uh, counter cut jimping on the spine there. And uh, just, a, just a great blade. That's a five inch blade. One, two, three, four, five and a half inch blade and very capable, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so these, are, these three were what I was carrying today. And, uh, Felt very uh, good having them on, though really the the Finch was the only one that got any uh, use, and it was on paper. I <laughs> I have uh, these notepads at work that never uh, tear off on the perforation. That drives me nuts, so I always score it, and I was using this to score it. That's it. That's all I used my knives for today. But I was ready for other things if they came up. So that's what I was carrying today. What were you carrying today? Uh, let me know. You can you can drop it in the comments below. And while you're down there, <laughs> uh, hit the like button, subscribe, and the notification bell. That way, uh, when new videos get uploaded, you are notified. 724-466-4487 uh, is the phone number if you want to leave a message. Let us know what you're carrying. Now, uh, before we move on to Knife Life News, I, I just want to talk about some unsung heroes. We had a whole show on unsung heroes uh, last year sometime, but these are knives that are always on my desk and that get a lot of actual use. Um, now, I have always have a bunch of knives milling around on the desk that I'm either uh, going to use in a video or have in for review or are is in on loan or whatever. And... Um, and that's one thing, but there are some perennial favorites that just sit there and get used. That's what I'm saying. And these two, these are recent uh, acquisitions over the last year. And I just want to highlight them because I've been using them quite a bit. First uh, desk knife of note is the Mike Emler Kiridashi. You know, Mike Emler. He does. Uh, he's got a, a YouTube channel, quite prolific with the live streams. And he's also 
known as Crazy Sharp, his uh, his sharpening service. I've had him, uh, he, he was the sharpener for Ferrum Forge for quite some time for their custom projects. He still is uh, and uh, gets things razor sharp through this technique he learned while living in Japan. And uh, it's, he's, uh, he has taken care of a couple of my knives, uh, chief among them, the Spidey Chef, which he altered the blade and gave it a, an incredible edge. Anyway, he sent this to me as a little gift a little while back. And I thought it was, you know, cool. I thought I would wear it around my neck. It is an excellent neck knife, but it has ended up living on the desk. It is the perfect utility blade. Extremely sharp chisel grind. It's only about an inch and a half. Wait, what is this? Uh, it's an inch and three quarters long, that edge. And nicely rock patterned on the spine. So it gives you the feel of jimping. Of course, I put some paracord on there. It, now it's excellent and very, I mean, it's very sure in hand. And I just love this little knife. Um, do you have a desk knife? Is this something, uh, is it just me or do you have a desk, uh, a knife that camps out on the desk? It's probably a fixed blade that gets used for a lot of random tasks. That's definitely this. All right. And then the other one is one that was given to me also by the maker. Um, here it is. Marcus Williamson. This is the Merlin and it's just a beautiful little knife with a gorgeous handle. Uh, you remember I showcased this uh, quite a bit a little while ago when, when he gave it to me. He sent it to me for review, and then when I asked for his address back, he said, oh, shucks, keep it. And, uh, man, I was so happy because I really grew fond of this knife. It's the perfect little utility knife. Three fingers, no, four fingers. Look at that. That sloping um, pommel there accommodates the pinky and, and allows you to actually get a, a full four finger grip but in a in a full sort of fist so that your pinky is kind of all the way into your hand that thumb rests on the back you can really power through material with this uh it's a nice sharp edge pretty pretty fine behind the edge though it's a it's a pretty steep uh bevel there but very, very, very sharp and just a gorgeous handle composition here. It's wood on the outside, Bacote wood, I believe it is on the outside. And then you've got sort of a uh, mint green and then a lighter mint green and then an orange, three really thin layers of G10 before that nice polished steel. That's 8160 steel. Is that a thing? 81, 84, 73 high carbon steel. I, I'm sorry. I don't remember what it is. I just totally made that last number up, but uh, he made this cool little pocket sheath for it. So it sits in here. Uh, it's a leather pocket sheath. And uh, it just kicks it right here on my desk. And uh, kind of you forget about it. You don't see it, but it gets the job done uh, with some frequency. So I just wanted to call attention to these knives and uh, uh, give your desk knives some love, ladies and gentlemen. All right, coming up, uh, we have the uh, Knife Life News and the State of the Collection. And then we'll talk about old gold. But first, I want to remind you about Patreon. If you think what we do here is worth it, uh, go to Patreon and help support us. You get a lot of stuff uh, in return, including entered into a monthly knife drawing. And uh, also you get interview extras. Uh, every interview we do, we do a little bit extra just for the patrons. We talk about stuff that maybe we don't want to talk about on the main uh, interview. And it's always a lot of fun. So check it out. Quickest way to go there is to go to the knifejunkie.com and just go knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, the knifejunkie.com slash patreon are you looking for a book about knives or knife collecting knives and self-defense or the yearly knife bible filled with hundreds of pages of information and pictures about your favorite knives shop at the knifejunkie.com slash books for your traditional favorites new books about knives and the yearly knife bible get your favorite knife book and support the show at the knifejunkie.com slash books so as Buck has been doing, uh, they have released their new Buck of the Month uh, for March 2022. And this one's cool. It's it's a rehash of a discontinued fixed blade. Uh, it's the 117 Brahma. This is a premium version of it. And uh, what the Brahma is, it's sort of a tactically oriented version of the 119 Special. You've seen me show that here quite a bit uh, over the years. Uh, it's the classic Buck Bowie knife uh, in the five and a half inch 
uh, version. This one has uh, they've they've brought the 117 Brahma back. It's it's got a bit more of a uh, clip. It's got a a slightly differently shaped blade and uh, a single quillion down on near the forefinger. And on this one, they've made it an S35 VN and um, green canvas micarta, which is super cool. Now, the original uh, 117 Brahma looked a bit like a K-Bar with a stacked leather handle uh, with fluting carved in. Uh, but this one is uh, an upgrade kind of parallel to all the other fixed blade upgrades uh, they've been doing recently with the with the S35 VN uh, blade steel and the green canvas micarta. Uh, I've kind of wanted to get my hands on these uh, because I really do like my 119 special. But man, I got to say, in, in, the, in the universe of fixed blades that I want, uh, I'm not ready to double back, uh, but this one is, is the kind of knife that could get me to double back. Uh, and the reason I say that is there are just so many knives, so little time, so little money, and um, and I have buck covered. And then they come and they dangle this in front of my face. I, I really, I think it is one of those uh, rehashes in uh, my Carta and S35 that to me is the most tempting because everything else is just exactly the same. Uh, except different materials and i can live with the materials uh the 420 and the whatever that plastic is on the handle of my original 119 so that's what the buck of the month is about it's about tempting people tempting people who know they don't need these things but uh man making them just so sweet and and hard to resist uh, okay, so still to come on the Knife Junkie podcast, a state of the collection we're going to take a look at some knives in on loan and a couple that i just uh acquired and then old gold 10 great long serving knives right here on the knife junkie podcast and now that we're caught up with knife life news let's hear more of the knife junkie podcast this uh past couple of weeks you know that i've been digging on this this is the uh the concept preta 2 it is a k max rom design uh jonathan renaudin a k max rom a french knife designer who I've been following for years on Instagram has been uh, has been making a splash with first Fox knives and then Kaiser and now Concept with these great great knives. This uh, Preta two is his most recent with Concept, and it's a pretty uh, nicely sized uh, 3.6 inch S35 VN blade. This this one has the titanium handle, and uh, I really love it. Uh, and then I was so thrilled to see uh, uh, my, my good buddy Dave from This Old Sword Blade Reviews. He's, he's my tactical folder na maven. He, uh, he started showing this off. I was like, I didn't know they made this with a micarta handle. And so, yeah, they've come out with this knife, the Preta 2, in a liner lock with a micarta handle. Now, I initially uh, was mistaken when I said that this is a White Mountain Knives exclusive. Um, but the only place I was ever able to find this knife when I did a search was White Mountain Knives. So, and it looks a bit like their exclusive Beglider XL uh, with the natural micarta. And so I, I jumped to the assumption that, okay, now, now White Mountain Knives is going to do all of their exclusives and tan canvas micarta. And so I jumped to that conclusion. But what a great knife. I got to say, I mean, I really, really love the, um, the titanium and, and the translation to the micarta liner lock for much less is brilliant this thing is awesome so i opted for the clip point double peaked bowie uh style blade and man i'm so happy i have a representation of of both i mean like this represents the full spread of the preta 2 line uh, you can get a titanium frame lock you can get a a, a micarta handle liner lock you can get tanto you can get uh, clip point and mix it all up in in any sort of configuration. They also have black uh, in the in the titanium. So lots to choose from. What a great knife! If you like a uh, bit of a medium to larger size knife, um, this you cannot go wrong. I really think Concept is doing a an incredible job. I love the Concept knives I have. I have four now. Um, the other two, one of them is also a uh, K Max Rum design. That's the Pelican. Um, so really check it out if you can. Uh, check it out if you're interested. Uh, this new Kaiser, or Kaiser, God, I keep saying that, Concept 
Um, that's a, a, these guys came from Kaiser, I believe. Uh, but the new concept Preta to in my Carta, you'll dig it. All right. Next up, this was a total impulse buy. I was buying stuff for the family and for myself on, uh, Amazon and something that I saw deep in my cart, you know, in my save for later, uh, I saw, and I just, I just, jumped on it i don't know why uh but i'm glad i did it's a it's a 30 dollar knife and it was an impulse buy and uh it was a good one it was a good one because it's a less george design and uh it's uh the second inexpensive kershaw less george design that i i own this one is the xcom and this is a candidate and it's based here let let's look at it for a second we know less george he is a real fan of and modern day interpreter of classic combat blades. This is a is based on his XCOM custom knife, which is based on the M3 trench knife, uh, the 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 proto K bar, if you will. It was a uh, had a blade much like this, long sort of bayonet style. Sometimes that back edge was sharpened, stacked leather handle with the fluting. It had a great quillion uh, uh, facing forward, so. The handguard had a downward facing quillion right by the finger and a forward facing quillion for your thumb. So you could, uh, you know, thrust with it uh, with a certain surety. Uh, always thought it was cool that he made a folding version of that. Just like, um, I don't know, I always thought it was cool that Medford made folding version of the K-Bar kind of. I, I like these odes to the comp classic combat knives in folder version this is 8 cr 13 mov with a with a very sort of un not unfinished but cheap feeling you know grn handle and i say cheap because uh right here on the seams you know where where it stops and where the liner kind of comes in on the inside it's sharp and it just kind of feels well it feels like a 30 dollar knife for sure but i always like the design and i think that this should be something that zt should consider as a knife to to help with their comeback you know the 308 i felt was a was a good comeback knife and i think they need to continue with that trend they don't i don't want them to go away and i don't want them to just do kind of fancy uh, you know polarizing collaborations this knife could be loved by many it could be loved by by many it's a less george design so everyone knows and recognizes his talent and the you know it would and zt's manufacturer it would come down to the design do you like it and i think they could make a pretty penny on this and and do it right you know do it with uh do it with just just like this but upgraded what can i say um just a cool design so i'm glad i got it i will probably i might send it to my brother because i know he well he's definitely a World War II buff and that kind of thing. I think you will definitely appreciate this design. Uh, I mentioned in my video of this, uh, well, that's no promise, Victor, uh, but I, I talk about this in the video that this would make a, an excellent car or truck knife. Uh, something you put in the door, that little door pocket, and then when you need it, when you need a knife to cut something, boom, it's there. It's HCR, it's super sharp. And, uh, you know, if you need to strop it or sharpen it, you can get it keen uh, right quick. Uh, but it's also got a bit of menace to it, and you could definitely use it in a pinch to defend your life. It's got that excellent uh, puncturing, thrusting blade shape. So, cool knife. XCOM ZT, why not make the XCOM? Why not? You would just call it 09 something something, because I think Les George has the nines, and uh, you'd, make, you'd make a lot of money on that. I, I do believe that that is true. All right, next up. I just spoke with Brian Brown, uh, and he will be on the podcast uh, post haste quite shortly. But uh, oh, episode three hundred four, and he sent me some knives to check out, which was so cool, so generous. Because uh, afterward, you know, I, I just mentioned I look forward to seeing him at Blade Show and checking out his knives, and he's like, "Well, if you haven't seen any, let me send them to you." And and I said, "Okay." And so first up is the one that has really had me. Uh, um, at attention recently, and that is his Raptor model. He sent me this beautiful version of it, and I have some specs on it. Hang on. Whoops. Sorry, left-handed. Not so good. 
Okay, so before we get to the specs of this, just look at this beautiful thing. And you're sitting in your car, you're thinking, I can't look at it, Bob. What's it look like? Well, it's got a Bowie blade, it's a clip point blade, and it's got two beautiful peaks on the top with a full swedge that comes all the way back to uh, the, the thumb ramp. It looks like a Mac V SOG Bowie, uh, just dressed up and, you know, uh, just beautified. Brian Brown, if you're familiar with his, his custom knives and his design as produced by Riot, you will know his, uh, his knives are gorgeously designed. So imagine if you've never seen this Raptor before and you've been living in a cave that it's a Mac V SOG in, in a beautiful, classy, um, titanium frame locking package uh no flipper which i love beautiful thumb studs this version has mokutai uh fittings here so uh pivot collar is a beautiful mokutai and oh my gosh you know i don't have much mokutai in my life well i have none in my collection and occasionally it will uh come through here as a loner but i've decided after having this i i think i need something with this beautiful material on it because that is gorgeous Oof. uh and then the blade is a bjorkman's twist damasteel blade bjorkman's twist there you go you can see it a little bit there just a gorgeous damasticine blade and look at that the ergonomics of this are outstanding this is a three and a half inch blade and it fits in a quite a svelte little package. I got to say, you know, I have three and a half inch blades, uh, bladed knives that feel much larger than this. Uh, the, the handle uh, slims out here and widens, slims out right after the pivot and widens uh, at the pommel, which gives you a channel for your hand to fit in. So it really, if you did have to thrust this or use it to puncture a material, um, a stubborn clamshell package or something. The shape of this handle is going to keep you and, and this excellently gimped thumb ramp is going to keep your hand in place. And uh, the same goes for the back here. Very comfortable. And that curved clip, very comfortable in hand. You don't even notice it. Such a beautiful knife, wonderfully produced by Riot and excellent, excellent action. I'll put that down here. Thank you, Brian, for loaning these knives to me. Uh, next up, you've seen the Jaeger M. Well, this is a prototype. This was Wee's prototype of the Jaeger M. Let's take a look. Okay. It's blasted titanium, just kind of plain Jane, um, acid, acid etched, black, or uh, you know, kind of a dark titanium. Oof. Okay, so it is pocketed in here. Uh, so there's some weight relief, but it does have, I mean, there's quite a bit of weight relief on the inside of the titanium slabs, but it still has a, a, subs, a substance and a, a heft to it. Perhaps it's that full and uh, fully uh, extended and fully crowned backspacer comes all the way up to close to the tang. It looks really cool. Might be adding a little bit of weight. Um, but as you, let's see, as we move forward up to the blade, there's a square flipper tab that works really well, engages that blade very nicely. Uh, you get a nice, large sharpening choil that will allow you, if you have a fixed angled system, to avoid hitting, bumping into that titanium. You have his classic Jaeger um, sort of cleaver blade or Warncliffe, very, very steep Warncliffe blade. You've got a swedge and a, and a nice hollow grind. Let's, you can see it if you look at it on its uh, in cross section. So uh, very nice ergonomics on this. You know, I don't ordinarily go for the double finger choil. I've been saying that a lot. I think people are doing it better than uh, my or maybe my hands are learning. But this is a comfortable, comfortable knife with that double finger choil. You would never need it for this because of uh, the fact that that tip isn't so acute. But I love how it feels in reverse grip, just just as a as a note. So this is not the company that he went with to build his Jaeger, but it's cool to see Wee's interpretation of it. 
And then here is a customized uh, uh, customized Riyadh uh, version of it who ended up making it. And customized by, let's see, the, the fan uh, Fanatic Edge did the crosshatch milling uh, on the handle, which is... Whew, which is stunning, feels wonderful. This knurling is just satisfying to the hand. The other side is just a straight, smooth titanium uh, lock side. You've got the Mokutai fittings again. Very beautiful. A, a smoother, lighter action. The whole thing feels much lighter, actually. Much lighter than the Wii version. And could it be because they took so much steel off of that? blade this thing is ground like a razor like a straight razor it comes so thin it's a high deep hollow grind and it comes to ridiculously thin behind the edge i'm going to put this up to my microphone sometimes you can tell how thin a blade is by listening i don't know i don't know if you can if you can tell but it is like a straight razor and just incredibly produced um something i like about all three of these is that they do jet out they do rock it out but to close them they're not guillotines you can obviously shake them in but you get a nice satisfying feel i like placing the blade back in the handle i i usually prefer that to to drop shut to just fall shut uh so there they are, the, the Brian Brown Raptor, all dressed up in uh, fancy, fancy steel. And then the Wii prototype for the Jaeger M and then the production version, though customized by Fanatic Edge. These things are amazing. Uh, I, I really want a Raptor. I'll say it right now. You know, I've, ne I've never been uh, too too uh, secretive about that fact but now that i have it in hand for a while i was like oh it's too small i don't have to worry about trying to get that but now that i have it and i see oh that's a three and a half inch blade this is like right up my alley this works beautifully this would be an excellent knife uh, if i had to wear a suit you know some every once in a while i have to wear one to work or or to an occasion oh this would be a great knife and then in between oh i i could this would definitely fit perfectly into my collection so thanks brian for exposing me to that now i have something else to obsess over uh but uh, thank you for your awesome work all right speaking of awesome work let's talk about 10 awesome knives that have been around for a long time that have i'm calling them old gold that's what they are they're old gold my 10 greatest longest serving knives and uh it, this all came up when i saw number nine chilling over at the end of our bar next to all of the old uh de Kuiper and nasty sort of um mixer stuff that we never ever used but that we have uh way down there there was the knife lurking and i was like oh yeah i forgot about this what a great knife and it just got my mind going on this uh but we'll get to that one in nine knives the first one i have to show off is the most prized among them and probably among my entire collection and this was the first one and this is the one my grandpa gave me it's an old uh, camillus scout knife boy scout style knife so you've got the blade which has been sharpened down to a flat uh thin blade you've got a bottle opener here you've got a screwdriver and cap lifter and then by here so there, there there's that the classic setup but by far the most used tool on this knife my whole childhood is the awl. This thing has an amazing awl, and it I did everything with this awl. Um, I was just remembering that I used to take uh, the pins out of watches with this awl. It was the only thing I didn't, you know, I didn't have a, there was no Amazon. I couldn't just get a watch tool. Where am I going to get a watch tool? So uh, I used this, the sharp little edge of this awl could, could sneak in past that little ridge on the springs of a of a watch spring uh, for the band and just open it up. I always loved watches when I was a kid, and this is how I would change the bands. So this knife, this uh, this old Camilla Scout knife, I know was one that my grandfather used 
a lot. I have a bunch of his old pocket knives and he used them literally to death. He used them until the blade was like a scalpeling little nubbin. And uh, this one came out relatively unscathed, though I know he used it quite a bit because he sharp. I never sharpened that blade. Uh, you know, he did. He did that. I never reshapened it. I, I never reshaped it through sharpening. I did try to sharpen it on stones when I was a kid. Uh, and then have touched it up since. But there it is. Uh, old gold number one for sure is the old Camillus Scout Knife from Grandpa T. Grandpa Tignorelli. Thank you, sir. Uh, love you. All right. Next up, Leatherman Side Clip right here. This thing was a Christmas gift from my brother. And I remember very clearly pulling it, it out of my stocking and feeling it and just knowing it was a knife. And then opening it up and seeing a tool, a Leatherman tool, and feeling a little disappointed, I got to say. Like, oh, kind of wish it was like cold steel. Uh, and this this was many, this is at least 25 years ago, um, I think. <laughs> but uh, this has gotten more use than any of my knives ever. This, this has been in every junk drawer. Uh, it used to live in my car. It's, it's, been, it's been everywhere this this painful little tool you know they did nothing to to make the handle comfortable when it's when it's in screwdriver mode it was the first one they made with a clip and the clip i can never tighten because there's some weird proprietary uh uh five five pointed star with a with a little peg sticking up you know you need a special wrench to to work on this knife up uh, on this uh, leatherman but just god i love this thing and like I said, it's just gotten years and years and years and years of use. This is the kitchen uh, Leatherman, and it lives there. And uh, I think this may have appeared in Unsung Heroes <laughs> uh, because it is. Uh, love that thing. Thanks, Vic. I do appreciate it. Next up, summer of 1991. Lost summer. Uh, I was living in Boston, and... Uh, going to art school there and right around the corner there was a knife shop downstairs and i went in and i bought this i loved sog knives and the sog mac v uh, bowie and they had this and i couldn't believe i was looking at a folding knife that act that looked like this i was like i was blown away by how cool and tactical it was you know how much like the like the fixed blade folding knife uh fighting knife this looked like so I bought it and I carried it all that summer. It was dull as the day is long, but uh, I have since gotten it sharp, but I didn't care. I just carried this around in my pocket. And um, how did I carry such a heavy lock back in my pocket without going nuts? Well, this knurled rubber grippy material, which feels like it's uh, you know slowly decomposing as I touch it, but uh, you know it's leaving a, a residue on my hands. But this checkered craton rubber material kept the knife you know would grip the inside of my pocket and kept it uh north to south even when i was walking you know on the hoof around the city uh, so i loved this knife for a long time rarely had need to use it but used it when i could um and cut what i could with it but it, like i said it was dull and my sharpening skills were lacking i remember trying to get this razor sharp with a pull through <laughs> one of those pull through uh, abominations that destroys your edge. But eventually I brought it back from the brink. What a great knife. Uh, the, this old sog used to be the sting stingray. All right. So next up first, first major tactical knife in my collection, uh, major tactical folding knife. Of course I had had a couple of cold steel folding knives and those are, Yes, major tactical, but you'll know what I mean when you see this. It's my Emerson Commander. I got this in 2000, and I ordered it in 1999 and thought it was good. I was new to ordering on the Internet at the time, and the only thing I had ordered before then was a Macintosh that they sent, uh, a Mac computer that they sent the next day. And I thought everything that you ordered on the Internet showed up the next day. And I ordered this on Knife Center, not seeing that uh, it wasn't even made yet. You know, uh, Emerson Knives at the time was tooled up for some other knife. Maybe they were making the CQC7. 
or something. But but I ordered this and it didn't come the next day or the next day or the next day. And I don't know, maybe I was less aggressive in those days or didn't understand email or online buying. And I didn't harass Knife Center. I just, oh, 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 I guess they'll send it when it's ready. And then I forgot all about it. And uh, a year goes by and boom, it shows up on my desk at work. And <laughs> uh, it was 200 bucks at the time, which I certainly could not afford. I still consider 200 bucks an expensive knife. Um, but this one... This one's the classic. It's got the build like a custom knife where uh, all of the guts of it, the structure of it is held together by hardware that is under this uh, G10. So you have to remove the G10 with these little screws and then you get to the structural uh, stuff underneath it. A uh, classic, classic knife. I saw this uh, after shortly after I became familiar with Filipino knives and Filipino knife fighting, and I saw this recurve blade, and I just about lost it. I had to have it, and I still feel that way about this. I feel like I should get a a late a latter day version of it. This is from this is two thousand. Um, says two thousand on the blade. That's when it was manufactured. I'd love to get uh, a current one today with the single detent and the, you know, the different action and the different build. And, uh, you know, the new Emerson's are thicker than this in hand. And, um, well, there are, there are myriad differences with this. Even the blade is slightly different, but this has that long swedge down the back, just a classic Emerson with that awesome symbol, uh, simple logo. So yeah, love this thing. This has done a lot of uh, cutting and has gotten very, and I've gotten it very sharp over the years. All right, next up, last folder. This one has uh, uh, most recently served as a backyard knife. But this one, uh, I used to carry this, index carry this, uh, when I was a thinner lad living in New York City. I would carry this, minus the lanyard. Uh, this is the Vaquero Grande. It barely fits in, this, in the uh, frame here. This is the six-inch... Uh, recurved Vaquero um, Cold Steel XL before they had the Voyager line. This is this was just its own thing, and, <laughs> and it reminded me a lot of the um, Navaja. And then later have come to realize uh, through watching um, Lynn Thompson talk about it that blade is based on the Turkish Yatagan. Uh, that has a severe, uh, an extreme recurve, but brings the point back up to center line where it would be on a dagger. So you can, um, you can be thoroughly oriented, uh, point oriented when you're fighting with it and thrusting and know exactly where that point is, but also get the benefit of a deep recurve on slashing. Um, so I always love this thing. And with the, it, it was only available at the time I bought this with the serrations. Um, but you know, that's, that's what makes this so utterly devastating are, are those serrations now? Yeah. It, crazy that I carried this on my person frequently, like at a certain time, like all the time when I lived in New York, I, I, I believed like, uh, like Lynn Thompson says, you can do a lot, you can do everything with a big knife, uh, that you can with a little knife and more, but not vice versa. And that was kind of my way of looking at it. I also thought like, psh, you know, bulletproof. I was just young. How am I going to get pinched with this? Not to mention the fact that I never thought of like, what if I used this? You know, I, I'd, I'd have been in Rikers. So I, I'm just glad I never had to, never did. And, um, you know, glad those kind of foolish days are behind me uh, because mostly because, um, you know, I, I could have been could have been awful. But this was my my EDC for a while. And then it became my back door, uh, back door, my backyard knife of choice. I don't have a back door knife of choice, uh, but I do have a backyard knife of choice uh, for folder. And this was it for a long time. Those serrations and that recurve are uh, stunningly effective on brush and even light, uh, like sapling type things, though uh, they do start to gnar uh, gnarl at the teeth if you start hitting hard material. Uh, but for brush and stuff, and you can choke way back on that handle. You get a lot of utility out of this. So what started out as a, a you know, 
I'm a I'm a very bad man living in a very bad city knife uh, became a I'm a very suburban dad living a very suburban life knife. So there it is. Uh, folder. Next up is the this one is cool. This this now resides in my wife's office in a discreet location. And um, it is the CRKT. This is discontinued. I just saw you can buy one for 300 bucks now, but I bought bought it for like 50 back in the day. It came with two sheaths. This is the uh, Casper Fighter. Uh, it, it was a a knife. Originally, it was a custom collaboration between two of my favorite old school uh, tactical uh, EDC fixed blade fighting knife makers, Al Polkowski and and Casper. Uh, what was Casper's first name? Suddenly, I'm having a brain lock here, but. Polkowski, Al Polkowski, I remember I discovered at the New York Custom Knife Show years and years and years ago and saw his table and was stunned by his uh, full tang, flat, really uh, um, discreet and hideable double-edged fighting knives. I was stunned. I, I, I was like, who carries these things? These are amazing. What are these? Like, are these like do mercenaries buy these and like and then I saw this guy. He looked like Biff. You know, he had a white baseball cap and and he looked like a sorority boy. And he walked up to Al Polkowski and he's like, he's like, Mr. Polkowski, I just want to thank you for the most amazing knife. And he lifted up his shirt and he had a custom version of this knife. And he pulled it out and he was like, I love this thing, whatever. And he and I was amazed. So Al Polkowski has is a legend. He's he is uh, no longer with us. And, and actually, he was kind of surly with me. <laughs> But it kind of adds to his legend in my mind. And uh, this this uh, fighting knife here is just a, a great production version of that. And you don't see too many, if any, now production versions of his work. And, of course, also uh, the knife maker, Casper. <laughs> Sorry, I'm forgetting his name. But uh, you can see that a lot in this handle um, for sure. Uh, excellent jimping on this uh, thumb placement on the back of the blade. It's that that swedge. I always thought, man, I, someday I'm going to sharpen that swedge uh, as it should be, but never have and probably never will. I don't want to destroy it at this point as you as it's now a collector's item. But it's a little uh, last ditch defense. If all the other defenses in my wife's office don't work, uh, she'll shiv them with this. Heaven forbid. All right. S next up, a a classic. Each each one I pick up, I'm like, oh, this one's a classic. And this one is. It's it's the Cold Steel Master Tanto that I bought at Remington Knives at the Randall Park Mall in 1987 or eight. Yes, that's right. It was 115 bucks, and I couldn't believe I was spending that kind of money uh, on anything. But here it was, and it would be in pristine condition if i didn't try to make a kydex sheath for it years back and put a scratch right down that uh right down that bevel it just sickens me every time but this has been with me a bedside still is uh ever since i got it it's also was my main travel knife for years and years it no longer is uh, i've retired it from that but every time i went anywhere and i did a lot of uh i had a uh, my wife and I had a long distance relationship for quite some time. And then, uh, and then I did a lot of back and forth between, uh, on the Eastern seaboard. And I would throw this in my, in my bag, such a great knife, a classic. This is the one that really got the, the American Tanto thing started. Lynn Thompson's design. And this is an old one with the brass. They don't make it with the brass anymore. This is aluminum, uh, the, the pommel and the, and the fittings it says made in Japan. And that sort of, uh, wait, let me, let me see if I can focus in here, but on the, on the Ricasso, it says made in Japan and sort of an American typewriter font. It's kind of funny. And then on the other side, Tanto by cold steel Ventura, California. It's just a great knife. I've always wanted to get a new sheath for it. This leather sheath is incredible, but it is starting to really show where, even though I've tried to, uh, you know, take good care of it, but I love the leather sheaths. I'm, I'm bummed that everything is Grivex now. Uh, I really wish they did some leather. Uh, 
on some of their nicer knives. This one deserves leather. Uh, next up, my brother got this for me in 1991. Why do I remember that? I think it's because I don't re- No, 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 not, not 91. I'm sorry. 1999. Uh, or thereabouts i was living in philadelphia at the time this is a was a release by k-bar at the time that was based on their classic usmc united states marine corps k-bar design from world war ii complete with the sharpened swedge very nicely sharpened swedge and a just everything else classic but that's the that's the main thing to me that differentiates this from most uh k-bars is that sharpened swedge it's got a slightly different blade shape a little more menacing and this one came with a uh, in a box that had a blueprint and and the blueprint of this knife and it was so cool and somewhere along the way i lost it i wish i didn't but this always kind of has like a almost like a red rust patina to it but it's not rusting you know um it's hard to explain is it parkerized or or not maybe i need to clean this sucker off a little bit uh but look at that nicely stacked handle and then it's got the classic construction where the butt cap is placed over the uh end of that tang and then a pin is driven through this way Kind of a different uh, uh, that pin is driven through sideways, a different sort of um, construction than we see on most fixed blade knives. All right, last two. Uh, last one here is another CRKT. This is the one that uh, lingers over by the the weird liqueurs that we never use on our bar in the basement. And it's the cold steel, I'm, I'm sorry, the CRKT Hisatsu. And This thing is a graceful, beautiful, uh, this is a Williams-designed knife. Um, He has some knives out right now. One of them is made by Winkler uh, under his own uh, shingle, and then he has uh, some updated CRKTs with uh, different builds and different different handles and such. But this this is sort of the granddaddy that started it, uh, the super sharp Hisatsu in a, a classic uh japanese style tanto uh it's got a slightly different shape in that it has an, a nearly a secondary point right there uh, i sharpened this to the point of ridiculosity um that shiny blade is always stuck in my craw a little bit i like uh, but because it looked cheap to me but i ruined it anyway in in sharpening it so uh this i don't know what scenario i imagined like uh maybe we'd be throwing a party And I would be bartending and then someone uninvited would come in and, uh, you know, challenge me to a duel across my own bar. And then I know I would have this back behind all the all the unused liqueurs and such. And uh, and I would grab this in one hand and a bottle in the other and go to town. I don't know. That's uh, maybe that's what I was thinking. But uh, so this really very nice knife gets hidden away (laughs) and not considered or used much. Um, actually it's never been used. It's only been, it's only been babied and, um, it is a very, very cool knife. I'd love to get some of the more, uh, premium versions of it that are coming out, even, uh, from CRKT. Love to get that one. Can't remember what it's called, but these, uh, Williams designed, uh, Japanese inspired Tanto style knives are just so cool. And, uh, this Hisatsu comes in a smaller size and a much larger size. And uh, it's it's basically you can get this in short sword length. Last up, uh, this is a uh, a knife I've had for a long time, probably twenty five ish years, and it's it's gone on adventures with me. And I I've uh, most most adventures I've had have been urban and have not involved fixed blades, um, but. This has been on, uh, this for a while was my travel knife, the knife I would take with me everywhere I went. And once I was up around Lake George and I was in in upstate New York and I was with a a girlfriend at the time, uh, a wonderful person. Uh, We were out and we were going on a hike and uh, we were going camping. No, no, we weren't going camping. We were going on a hike 
to sign, kind of suss out to see if we wanted to go. Anyway, we went on this long, long hike and we, and then we, you know, uh, indulged a little bit and got a little loopy and then thought we were on a loop trail that was going to bring us back. Sun was starting to set and we got to a point. Lake George is a very large lake and it's, uh, you know, it's got a lot of wilderness all around it. That's what we were walking through. It was gorgeous, but we got to a, a point in the, you know, uh, that jutted out into the lake and we realized that we were on a trail looping around the entire lake, which would have taken days. And, uh, where it was sun was setting and we came across this Australian special forces guy who just happened to be there. And he's like, you better get a tent crack it. It's sun's going to, you know, whatever he said. And, and then he mentioned mountain lions <laughs> and we were like, what? And so we beat a hasty retreat back the way we came, which uh, we had taken a languorous uh, three hours or so to get there. And we ran and, and from blaze to blaze and, the sun went down and we were running in the dark and I had a tiny failing mag light. And uh, that's how, that's how we got back. But the whole time I swear, I swear what my hand was on that knife a lot of the time uh, going out there, just regular hiking. It was in the backpack, but on the way back, it was on my hip and I had my hand ready to draw that thing at any moment because I just felt like maybe it was that guy saying mountain lion, or what have you. I don't know what it was, but I just felt like uh, there was something stalking us, you know, and, and maybe it was my imagination, you know, probably was, but man, I was freaked out. And the one thing that really made me feel like, don't worry, you got this if something happens, uh, was my uh, heretofore martial arts training and this Cold Steel uh, Trail Master. I was master of the trail that evening, ladies and gentlemen, master of the trail. No mountain lion, no nothing was going to hurt me when I had this on or, 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 my, uh, or my charge. Love how the brass has patinaed over the years. This is now my um, batoning knife for fire night. You know, when we do little fire nights uh, at our family fire pit. Love this thing. It's like a wedge. Just splits wood like crazy to make excellent kindling. Plus, when we're out there in the dark and we can't quite see beyond the firelight, that's not true. We can. We live in suburbia. But when we can't quite see beyond the firelight, having this in hand and uh, on my belt makes me feel 100 percent sure. So that's been a little trip down memory lane with old gold. These 10 great long serving knives. Uh, I've had them all for quite a long time. Some of them have received quite a bit of use. Others just quite a bit of carry, and, and through that, a bond has been formed. So uh, what are your great old long-serving knives? I mean, you could be new to knives. You could be uh, into knives for one year, but that first knife, those first couple of knives, those are the old gold. Those are the ones that got you excited and kept you coming back for more. So let me know what they are. Uh, leave a message on the listener line, 724-466-4487, or leave a comment down below and, uh, and let me know. Check out the next uh, uh, podcast on Sunday. <laughs> Sorry, that's the Sunday podcast. I talked to Brian Brown, maker of these fantastic and just gorgeous knives. This Raptor is in my future. Not this one, unfortunately. But uh, check out that interview. He is so cool. He's a great guy and uh, very humble and just killing it. So congratulations to him and, uh, and to me for having him on the show because he was great to meet. All right. And if you want to download us and listen to us on uh, the podcast apps, check them out right here. Apple, Google, iHeart, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and a whole host of others. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. 
Check out some great knife photos on the knifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at the knifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487. And you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.